All right, thank you. Um, and thank you also to the organizers. To the organizers. Uh, it feels really like a privilege to be here. Um, so I will talk about extreme ADS CFT and I will explain uh, what I mean with this statement. And before I start, I want to thank my uh, amazing collaborators without whom you know, these papers would not exist. And I will mainly talk about uh, these two papers. And when we talk to students and give advice on how to give talks, we often say that one should not talk about what one does not understand or uh, mix different topics. And I will do both uh, in this talk, uh, but I hope it works out in the end. Um, so when we do the simple top-down uh, vanilla ADS CFT um, pairs, then what we have are front improvement solutions of the kind ADS D cross XN, where XN is a compact uh, space, uh, typically just a sphere or some positively curved Einstein space. And the, the two questions I want to address uh, in my talk is the following. Is it possible to put D equal one here? What, what would that mean? Okay, there's no curved one dimensional space, but is there a meaning to this? Uh, and a second question, so that's what I consider to be extreme in the sense that I want to take D as small as I can. And another sense of being extreme is I'm asking myself, is it possible to make this space as small as I would like it, you know, like even vanishingly small, right? Um, what, what would that mean? And what would it be like the statement in the dual uh, CFT? Okay, so I will first address the first question. And this is where I meant that I do not fully understand what I'm talking about. So this is in some sense heuristic, uh, but this is a discussion oriented workshop. So I'm, I'm very interested in feedback on the idea. All right, and this is what I know best. So this crazy statement I will address in, from a supergravity point of view, okay? But I will say something about the would-be dual CFT. So as I said before, the prominent top-down ADS CFT dualities, the easiest ones, all feature front Rubin solutions. And um, we, we can think of those front Rubin solutions as coming from the near horizons of what we call the conformal brain example. So the conformal brains are the D3 brain, the M2 and the M5. Um, so you, you could ask yourself, okay, what about the other D brains, right? So as we know, as being pointed out, their, their horizons are singular, yet you, you could think of doing sort of holography. In this case, it, it's less understood, but the holographic duals would be um, Yang-Mills theory uh, compactified uh, on an N torus where N would not be equal to six, so there's, there's no uh, conformal symmetry. Um, but you see, in this context, I know of two examples of like, you could say extreme holography, quote unquote, um, and that is the matrix description of M theory and type 2B strings. So especially the type 2B case, which is known as the IKKT, IKKT matrix uh, model, that's a really zero dimensional field theory. There's not even time, it's just a matrix integral. Uh, and we can think of it as the theory that comes from you know, having a stack of the instantons and going to the near horizon uh, of them. Um, on the type 2A side or M theory side, of course, there's a BFSS uh, matrix quantum mechanics, which we can think of as a near horizon geometry of these zeros. What I want to talk about today is an extension of this, a conformal extension of this, okay? Um, so how, you know, maybe there's the next best thing you can do in order to get uh, conformal symmetries is to, by using the non-conformal brains, is that by making stacks of them, like non-trivial intersections, okay? The best example, known example, is of course the D1, D5 system. Despite the brains being non-conformal, if you intersect them in the right way, this is a supersymmetric way, you actually get the ADS3 cross S3 cross D4. What is less known, because they're non-supersymmetric, so most people don't seem to know these examples, uh, is that you can do the same. You can take any D brain, you can take its electromagnetic cousin and you intersect them and you will generate an ADS cross S cross T factor. Okay, so this is for the D2, D4 and this is for the ADS2 cross S2 cross C6. Maybe you know this one, this you could think of as the, what would be the name, the dionic, the near horizon of the dionic Kaluza Klein black hole or something like that, okay? But these two examples are non-supersymmetric. Uh, only the middle one is supersymmetric. Um, but you see, the, 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 the trick to get an ADS vacuum is by taking a brain, 
taking the electromagnetic dual cousin of that brain, put them together, and this stabilizes the dilaton. All right. And what I get is this chain, and you can even think of ADS5 plus S5 as part of this chain of vacua, because the D3 brain is its own electromagnetic dual. All right. So in general, I have a chain which is ADSD cross SD cross T 10 minus 2D. All right. And for odd D values, these are SUSY bound states, and they have known CFT duals. What I want to point out is that I don't know for you, but it was very hard for me to not contemplate d equal one in this chain, okay? And what would it be? It would be what you get from intersecting a d instanton or putting a d instanton near a d7 ring, all right? Something like this. Now, what is funny, uh, you, you, you can try to Google this, and this is essentially not discussed, okay? So for sure, this is not discussed in a single supergravity paper. There's no supergravity solution that corresponds to this bound state. If you know one, please let, not, not, you know, tell me, okay? I'm pretty sure there's none. Um, so why, why is that the case? So if you go back to the old supergravity literature, the way we think of brain intersections comes from what is called the harmonic product rule or something like that. It means that like for the D1, D5 system, I guess you have seen this. Um, there's a way to write down the metric. I'm ignoring dilaton and field strength, and I want to make my story simple. And the way these intersections work is that you smartly multiply uh, warp factors such that if you put one of the charges to zero, then one of the warp factors turns into the number one, and then you get either D1 brain or a D5 brain, okay? So this, there's a general way to do this, um, but you see, this is known, like this works for all D brains, except, and this was known for the D0, D8 brain. Okay, so when people first tried it, they were like, huh, this, this trick doesn't work. But later, of course, this was understood. And I will explain you how. But the fact that this doesn't work uh, also implies that the D minus, D minus one, D7 brain, uh, you cannot get uh, with this harmonic product rule, which is one of the reasons this solution doesn't appear in the supergravity literature, all right? So, but why, why doesn't this work? So for D0, D8, this is well understood, and this is called, you know, you could call it the Hanani-Witten effect, where it's known that if I have a D0 and I have a D8, I, there must be a string uh, connecting the two. So F1 means fundamental string in my notation, okay? So, unfortunately, what I cannot do, so, okay, this was understood in string theory, but then the corresponding supergravity solutions were also quickly written down here. You could say, why don't you take one of these supergravity solutions and then time like t-dualize them to get the d minus one, d seven system. For a technical reason I cannot explain now, this doesn't work, okay? It doesn't give you what you want. So we were nonetheless obsessed, you know, trying to find such a supergravity solution and what we used instead was the brains within brains uh, idea. And that actually does seem to help. And an example is, imagine you don't know the d minus one, d three solution and you wanna, you wanna understand it, what you could do is you can think of the D minus one brains as a bunch of gauge, gauge instantons inside the D3 world volume. And this helps you to write down the supergravity solution. So how does that work? Well, let me immediately apply it to the D minus one D7 bound state, okay? So in this case, the D7 world volume is eight dimensional super young mills, and I'm interested in finding gauge instantons. So of course they're not fully classified, but one class of supersymmetric instantons in AD super young mills come from this self-duality equation, all right? And then this would be the corresponding Potriagin index. And then it's useful, if you want to see the physics quickly, by writing down the D7 action in Einstein frame, and you assume these kind of fluxes, okay? So what you have in the, in the, the bosonic action, the leading term is just this for ND7 brains. It scales like GS, which is the tension of a D7 brain Einstein frame. Then this term doesn't scale at all. And you can think of it that if this is non-zero, you actually induce D3 brains on a D7 surface. Uh, because D3 brains don't scale with the string coupling in Einstein frame. And then this term, which is the, the leading higher derivative term, scales like one over GS. So when you plug this in, you will see that you exactly generate the profile of a D minus one. Uh, of a D instant on, 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 on top of a D7 ray, okay? So what do I see? I see something similar to the hanani witten effect. If I wanna describe D minus one brain with this kind of world volume fluxes, 
I necessarily generate a D3 brain. Okay, this is like, you know, the hananin witten effect is saying, okay, you cannot just have these two brains, there must be another brain generated. Here, the analog is that you cannot just go around with having a D minus one D seven, you must have a Euclidean D3, right? And you can also see this nicely from the Wessomino term. It also predicts exactly this brain must be there. So this is why from this answer, from this uh, just simple exercise, we got inspired to actually write down an answer. Not for the brain intersection, we didn't uh, succeed in that, but for the would-be near horizon. Okay, so here is the ansatz. Bear with me. Y is supposed to be my ADS1 coordinate. This should be my S1 coordinate, and this is the eight torus, okay? And to be completely clear, I put all the radii there, but there's no reason to do it. Then what is this? This is uh, my F1 flux, which should point in my ADS1 factor and my S1 factor. And I didn't mention it, but for all the other brain, like when all the ADS vacuum you get from a brain plus its electromagnetic dual, what you want is that the fluxes are self-dual, okay? So there must be a relation between alpha and beta, we'll see how this works. And then the, the reason on the previous slide implied that I have to write down a five form. Because I said there must be a D3 brain. So we tried this many answers a long time ago without a five form, we never got a solution. The moment we realized there must be D3 brains, we write this expression and we immediately found a solution, okay? Um, so you can show if you go through the equations of motion, once you obey these relations, this solves the equations of motion. And indeed, this means that you have one flux is imaginary self-dual as for this whole chain of vacuum, okay? You could ask me now, why would you call this to be ADS1? Well, there's no curvature, but what I can do is I can use a fact in analogy that, you know, Imagine I would measure the central charge for by looking at the curvature of ADS1 or the, or the size of the, you know, the, the sphere. It would give me the same answer, right? So what I can do is I can say, look, this is a compact S1 and I can use its size as sort of the measure of my, you know, length scale, my ADS length scale, all right? This is just an analogy, right? Um, so you can ask yourself, okay, did you, is it supersymmetric? And this is where you hit, this is another reason you cannot find these solutions in the literature. Almost every paper on Euclidean type 2b puts a huge thing under the rock, which is that there is no such thing as Euclidean type 2b supergravity. It simply does not exist, okay? I can refer you to this paper on the topic. Yet, we all secretly use it, and it's very strange in a way. Which, re yes, but I don't want to double my degrees of freedom. I want to have a real uh, supergravity algebra, super algebra, or at least a real section of a complex. No, so for Euclidean type 2a, of course I can have imaginary fields, but it is known that there is a consistent real section of the type 2a super algebra. It's known that this is impossible for type 2b, okay? Um, and what we noticed, we really were, you know, got this problem big time. And one thing you can see is that because F5 is imaginary self dual in Euclidean signature, to cut a long story short, I'm even claiming that if Euclidean type 2b exists, there are two options for the gravitino susi variation. And to, so this is what you normally find. This is same as in uh, Lorentzian signature. And I'm claiming I can also put an I. Why? Just think of the democratic formulation of type two supergravity. I can either use a field or it's Hodge dual. Well, the Euclidean signature, you have to tell me then, should I put an I or not? And I think both options are there consistently to the extent that Euclidean type two B exists. So if we go with the second option, that's when our background is actually supersymmetric with a global killing spinner, okay? Clearly this needs to be better understood as many of the things here, uh, but okay. Done with supergravity, what about uh, the, the actual dual CFT? I'm claiming that it, if it exists, it's constructed in this paper. I'm not going to explain you this, even the notation. Um, I, I put this to show you that there's a very explicit matrix model in that paper, which is analyzed to some extent. And the way to think of this matrix model, um, so a big chunk of this is just IKKT in a very non-trivial notation. 
And then what is added to IKKT are the interactions from D minus one, D seven strings. Okay? And this had to be extremely fine tuned. There's a long story there. Um, to make sure that everything is consistent. And I'm claiming, so, and what is this, what is this matrix uh, Lagrangian? This is actually, you can think of it, and that's what this paper is about, as the, the, the matrix integral for the instanton moduli on the D7 gauge theory, okay? So I'm, I'm claiming that, you know, this should be what we call the conformal matrix model. But what is that? What, what is a conformal matrix theory? So one possible definition of such a beast could be the following. So here is my uh, matrix integral, and I can think of it, so M is my matrix. I, I could call some of the couplings marginal, okay? And then what I want is, of course, I want to know, you know, there has to be some SOD plus one comma D Euclidean signature, but now, you know, D equals zero. So there should be some SO11. And this SO11, what it should be, it should be a rescaling of my matrices, right? So if this is a conformal matrix model, then the partition function in the end shouldn't depend on uh, these marginal couplings. So that essentially means that the partition function equals one. Okay, that would be the definition. And this independence of Z with respect to the marginal couplings is kind of sort of in the same spirit as saying that the, margin, the central charge of a CFT is independent of, of um, the position on the conformal manifold. Okay, so imagine you, you believe me here. This would mean, at least holographically, that if I would calculate the onshell action of my Euclidean solution, it should exactly vanish. Okay, and I'm not giving you the calculation, but this indeed happened in a very non-trivial way. So you know that if you wrongly compute onshell actions, it's very easy to get them to zero. You know, you have to be very careful. Here it happened because of a magic cancellation. Okay, so I think that's a very good sign. What's also a good sign is that our background actually has this as a one-one symmetry. We can rescale our ADS1 coordinates and everything is invariant with respect to that, okay? So what I'm saying is this is clearly only the starting point and this is a suggestion and I'm always interested for feedback, in feedback, okay? And I believe what we should have really done in this paper, which we haven't, although we had some communication with the authors, it turns out to be very non-trivial, is we should really compute the partition function, which they actually did, but there's a whole confusion about normalization, and actually verify that it's indeed constant in the way we say it is. That this would be the ultimate uh, proof, I would say. All right, okay, let me go to the second uh, extreme uh, thought, all right? So what's the, ex uh, the second extreme thought is not about can I make my ADS dimension as small as I want, but can I shrink my uh, space, which is orthogonal to my ADS factor in ADS CFT. So this is what Alessandro already nicely called scale separation. We heard it before in, in also in the talk by Chai yesterday. Um, so imagine that this can be done, right? What is the striking feature? Uh, from the point of view of conformal field theory, and there's not a single conformal field theory known that can do this at, the point, at this point in time, is that a CFT that is dual to such a real landscape like ADS solution has a very extreme, has a very strange property that uh, there are only a very few low-lying single trace uh, scalar operators, and then there is a parametrically large gap. Okay. So here I have the formulas for uh, 3D CFTs. Even more crazy, which is not often mentioned, imagine I want those scale separated ADS vacua that the string phenomenology is like. It comes with an extra insane property. Namely, what you want is that there are no tachyons in the ADS vacuum. So no tachyons above the BF bound, just no tachyons whatsoever. And that means that these um, CFTs have to be dead end CFTs, okay? They're endpoints of our G flows uh, because there are no relevant uh, deformations whatsoever, right? And it looks like these two properties combined, it looks very much like asking yourself, is there um, an understanding of the ADS, you know, CFT dual to almost pure ADS gravity? It's not exactly pure because I still allow a few low-lying scalars. And so these are very bizarre CFTs, um, and some general properties have been outlined in these two uh, fundamental pa foundational papers. But you should know that on the gravity side, there are no goes and conjectures against this being possible whatsoever. Okay, so let me quickly mention that. Um, am I doing okay on time? Yeah, okay, good. 
because um, I haven't paid attention to that. So let me quickly show you a very simple no-go, which is really trivial to understand. Okay, let us do 11 dimensional supergravity. So that means there's like a four form, but I'm using a notation where I only want indices of my fluxes to be internal. So when this four form is along four dimensions, I call it a seven form. All right, this is just my notation. So you see an F4 and an F7. And all the squares are therefore with Euclidean signature because all the indices of the flux are internal. So you know that whatever you see this, these are strictly positive numbers. The Einstein equations tell me that this is my four dimensional curvature in the most general case. And this is my seven dimensional curvature. So I see that the seven dimensional curvature is positive and I can only have ADS vacuum at best. But there's something nicer I can see with this trivial exercise. If I take the ratio between the integrals of these two curvatures, I can derive that it's bounded. Okay, what does that mean? Well, imagine that I call, if I take this bound and I define my curvature radii in the usual way, in this way, then what I can show is that there can be no scale separation between the curvature radii, right? But if I now assume and this is an assumption that I cannot take LKK, so the color line scale, length scale to zero at fixed curvature scale, then that also means that there's a no-go for scale separation, okay? A preciser treatment is of course in all, you know, the, the works by Alessandro, uh, which is one of the first, but he mentioned much more, right? So within this assumption, this is in bold here, we arrive at an extension of the Malasena Nunez no go theorem, right? So here's a picture of it. This is a cosmological constant in ADS, in sorry, in uh, KK units. So Malasena Nunez, within this, their same assumptions, they say no the sitter, no Minkowski, and we're saying, okay, but also no ADS vacua with a small CC. So no scale separation. But of course, a no go is only as strong as its assumptions. So the easiest way out is to include negative tension objects, just in the same way you do for, say, the sitter vacua of, of, for Malas and Anunias. And then we have the famous DJKT vacua, uh, and they have amazing properties. So this is type 2A with orientifold planes, certain fluxes, and there's an unconstrained flux. If you send it to infinity, you get these amazing properties. Okay, you get arbitrary strong scale separation, as much as you want. Uh, and supergravity limit is, you know, obeyed as good as you want. Yet, people are not settled on whether this is consistent. And one of the main reasons is that the, the, the back reaction of the intersecting oriented faults is not fully understood. Okay, and, but there's some interesting recent progress where it has been computed at first order in perturbation theory, although this perturbation theory doesn't see the intersection, and this is exactly where the tricky parts might be. Okay, a less easy way out of the no-go is to go around this bold statement. Is this possible? Okay. Actually, there was a recent paper by these people here, and to cut it short, this was a more of a CFT paper, but if you translate it into geometry, they would say that no. Their conjecture is that this statement cannot happen for positively curved Einstein spaces. Interestingly, whenever you have negatively curved spaces, it's trivial to obtain. Positively curved, I didn't know of an example. They, have, they conjecture, not possible. Um, so I invite you to read this paper. There's, it mainly is a, it comes actually from CFT statements, but they actually nicely translate into conjectures about pure geometry, okay? But the, one of the main points of my talk is that these two statements, I can relate them. And we did. So what did we do in this paper? We pointed out that there is a generalization of the DJKT solution without Roman's mass. That means if I have something in type 2A without Roman's mass, I can live to M theory. And if I have OC explains, what is so nice about that, they become pure geometry in M theory, right? And so the solution we found, which we describe in type 2A, we did many checks, it should lift to a pure Freund Rubin vacuum in 11D, which is scale separated. It's just insanely hard to write down the exact metric and to see how it exactly goes around 
these conjectures uh, by Collins et al. All right. And that's because our lift is not fully explicit since we only have a first order description of the back direction of the oriented fold planes. But honestly, a priori, I think it's controlled. So I would say, I'm not going to give you the details, but this work points out the existence of a seven dimensional Einstein manifold, which seems also the first dimension where you can go around all of these conjectures. And this Einstein manifold is built from some kind of a, a circle vibration of you know, a nil manifold in a very specific way, all right? Anyways, I just want to give you the message that, yeah. Yeah, arbitrarily small. Yeah, I mean, be careful in, in uh, KK, I mean, in ADS units, right? So it's a ratio. So the, the, the Planck scale actually diverges, right? So the, the volume goes to infinity so that the supergravity limit is always good. But it's a ratio LADS over LKK that goes to infinity. Is that clear? Okay. Minimal. Yeah, always minimal. And that's my uh, next slide. But before I go to that, I just want to give you a curious feature, especially for the bootstrappers. Five minutes, yeah. No, no, our solution is super symmetric. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I probably don't understand your question fully. Uh, I, this is a slide I hope to sort of excite the people working on CFT side of things. Um, so first paper discussing the would-be CFT dual to, to DJKT is this paper by Haruni et al. But then uh, things were looked at a bit more careful by the group in Oxford, and they just noticed a curious feature that all operator dimensions in this DJKT you know, supergravity solution, in, in the dual of it, they're always integer. Okay, but this is with minimal supersymmetry, right? And that is very awkward. There's no reason uh, for that to be the case. Um, I don't know. So I, I think this is very special, and I'm curious to hear if anybody has a thought about this. Recently, there was a nice paper by Finn Uppers who come, just showed that this is actually due to polynomial shift symmetries uh, on the supergravity side, which, uh, which appear in the large n limit. Okay, But if there is a CFT dual, because DJKT actually exists, it's a consistent string theory background. I don't know, it feels like this points to something very non-trivial, um, but it beats me. Um, I'm almost done. I just want to mention there are also famous swampland conjectures against scale separation. And this paper is sort of well known for this. Uh, and there was a refinement uh, by the group in Madrid. So imagine this is the equation, forget the square root of k. The square root of k is a refinement. Let me just first of all mention this. So the, the standard conjecture would be that the KK scale is always of the same order as the ADS scale, always. That means the whole, what we call string landscape in string fino is out of the window, right? This square root of K was pointed out by the group in Madrid, and I'm not gonna give you the details, but it comes from the fact that if the ADS vacuum has a discrete ZK three form symmetry, they have some heuristic reason that this square root of K should be there. And then you can actually achieve scale separation. And DJKT nicely obeys this, right? So this we call the refined strong ADS distance, distance conjecture. So the counterexamples to the, the one without square root of K is of course DJKT, but also KKLT, large volume scenario, etc. But I must point out that there's even a counterexample to this version. And this is a solution we found uh, a few years ago by but not in four dimensions, namely in three dimensions. It's something like DJKT. You can look at massive type 2A on a, on a G2 space with oriented fold six planes, and then even this is not true anymore. All right. Um, so where does this argument come from? It comes from applying the so-called distance conjecture, which I think many of you know. It tells me that if I'm in a field theory and I go away from the original vacuum, the effective field theory breaks down because there's a tower of modes which becomes light in the following way, where this is an order one factor and this is a distance I'm traveling in field space. So what did these people do to get to the distance conjecture? They, they apply this formula, but to metric space. So they say, okay, imagine I have a scale separation, 
there's this whole series of ADS like here, we'd get more and more scale separated, and then you travel in metric space towards it, you apply this formula, and you find this equation, where LKK equals L ADS. However, I don't know of any good reason why we should believe in the existence of the distance conjecture applied to metric space. In fact, we show that we can hop from one vacuum to another. We don't have to do that in metric space. We can actually do it in good old scalar field space. This is something we recently pointed out. And if you do that, I'm giving you another argument for why to trust in scale separation. We exactly find that this equation is beautifully satisfied. One minute left, and that's good because this is my second last slide. So what did we do? Very quick, you, you can think of this slide as an extension of Reed's fantasy to much light stabilization, all right? So imagine I have, for different fluxes, different ADS vector, like ADS5 process 5. What we're saying is we can actually go from one vacuum to another, not by discrete domain wall, by singular domain walls, but smoothly in scalar field space. You just have to be smart and find the scalar that does that for you. Usually people integrate it out. It's some open string degree of freedom. And we pointed out that we found this guy for DJKT. And in fact, we even claim this scalar should be in the effective field theory. Why? Just very quick. The size of these wobbles that bring you from one to the other one, this size, I call it V of Psi, is parametrically smaller than the vacuum energy. So we say, no, this, this thing should be in the EFT. Once you allow it, you can do it, and we exactly obey the distance conjecture. So we're saying we don't see any problem whatsoever and from this point of view with DJKT and the like. All right? So I have no time for this, so probably I should skip it. I wanted to point out some other conjectures related to this. Uh, but so it's time to go to my discussion slide. So I tried to achieve extremes. Um, I think a lot of work is needed. There's, there's no clear understanding of whatever I've said on the CFT side. But what I find very interesting is that at least some of these ideas lead to very simple yet difficult to prove statements in mathematics. Think about the statement I made about that there exist positively curved Einstein spaces for which a fixed curvature radius. I can actually dec um, make the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian as high as I want. So there's a mathematical conjecture against it. We are providing sort of a constructive proof how to do it. Um, and then I think I also suggested something non-trivial about matrix models for which I'm totally not an expert. So it would be nice to prove some of these things. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? So about the first part about the matrix model, so like you, you emphasize that it's important to also have these three uh, in order to have the supergravity solutions, whereas on the matrix model side, you did, well, it seems to me like uh, they didn't include like a D3 like degrees of freedom explicitly. They, very good. So they didn't use the word D3. What they said was for them the, the dual to the hanani witten effect is the fact that, so I didn't say any of these details, but there are two stacks of these seven brains. And what they had to do is to, on half of them, add a non-trivial abelian world volume flux, which was heavily fine-tuned. And when they fine-tuned it in exactly the right way, only then did the instantons have a moduli space. And then they can write down a matrix integral for it. But if you check, and that's what I wanted to point out, it's even in, in my appendix, if you look at their abelian world volume fluxes, I think I have it here, so what you see here are the fluxes. These are, you see, this is an eight-dimensional uh, anti-symmetric uh, matrix. Then these fluxes, if you put them in the world volume theory, they exactly behave like these three brains, right? So that, that's a part of the fluxes which I said behave like these three brains, which is not a part of the fluxes that, that give you the instantons. But they show that they are unavoidably there. So in that sense, I, I liked it a lot that these two things do match. And then this moduli that you mentioned is more like a, it's a bit like a size moduli of instantons. Or? Yeah, 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 because they also have a pure sort of eight-dimensional view. Right. And indeed, they show there's a correspondence with the usual, you know, 
size and position, etc. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay, for yeah. that you need to have a D3 like flux. But yeah, because if you don't, then everything is essentially stuck. Right. There are no right. uh, yeah, if you you just consider degrees high, of freedom yeah. anymore. If yeah. you just consider 8D super mills, I don't see any reason why you have size moduli. Right. Hey Thomas, thanks for the talk. Thanks. So just to understand, in the um, in your dual version of the JKT without the Roma's mass, if I understood correctly, you say that it is not in contradiction with the Maldacena Nunez Novo theorem because the manifold would be singular and you can shrink the KK scale to zero at this curvature, right? But then so then the, the point is you say it's not in contradiction because the supergravity approximation is going to break down, right? That's why it doesn't work. But then to what extent makes sense to trust the supergravity effective theory to derive all the quantities? Like, I mean, I feel that on one, on one side, you are saying that you cannot apply the novel theorems because supergravity breaks down. But on the other hand, I'm using the supergravity effective function to derive the results and the scale separation. No? Malas and Anunias does not uh, not apply because supergravity is not valid, but because I have an explicit negative tension source. Th that is the reason. And yes, whenever I have an oriented fault, then if you go close enough to but the orient from the M theory perspective, it's just M theory on a singular. From which perspective? M theory. Ah, so yeah, yeah, good. Okay, now I understand your question. No, no, no. So the way we avoid our own extension of and Nunez was not because of supergravity being non-valid. We're claiming that 11D solution should be completely geometric. Yes. Uh, the singularity should be understood um, in the same way that uh, for you know parallel oriented faults, it, it's like an Atiyah Hitchin resolution of the singularity. Um, no, no, no. The way it didn't work is because we use the assumption that if to derive the no-go, that if there's no scale separation between curvature radii, there is no scale separation in the usual sense. That's also what Collins et al. are saying. And what we're saying, no. Our construction shows that you can evade that statement. You, you can have a lack of scale separation between curvature radii, but there is still scale separation. Um, is that clear? Because I can decouple the eigenvalue of the Laplace and the lowest eigenvalue from the curvature. So at fixed curvature, I can take that eigenvalue to be as large as I want. Thomas, but you don't have an explicit 11D metric yet, right? So you have the 10D solution, which you expect you would be able to uplift to a concrete 11D metric. Once you would do that, you would indeed have a counterexample to what Collins and yeah. others were saying. I mean, uh, it's as explicit as DJKT is explicit. Right, right. You have, yeah, okay. So we have it. We even have the back correction up to first order imperturbation theory. Right, right, right. And yes, at some point you will compute second order. Speaking of which, do we know that DGKT actually is a solution of 2A? I mean, we don't have a proof, right? We don't have a Hayao theorem with fluxes and oriented faults, right? Could it be that it's just not a background of string theory? No. I don't see the obstacle for it, so. But we also don't have a proof, right? Okay, so what Nikolai I think is saying one way, the, the analogy that I like to think of is the way we, for instance, got to the definition of the existence of G2 manifolds, right? So if you go to like the papers of Joyce, there are a bunch of partial differential equations which you cannot solve, but at least you can argue that they have a smooth solution, although you cannot solve them. And I think what Nikolai is saying is what we have for type 2A with fluxes and oriented faults is that if you would describe really the full back reactive solution, there are a bunch of partial differential equations, which you cannot solve, but you're we are arguing that they still have a good solution. What, what is exactly this argument? So this argument is the usual function? argument that, so I, for me, it's, I don't have any problem with the argument. It's a bit like in, uh, take all other oriented fault solutions with fluxes, like uh, Giddings, Kachru, Polchinski, all right? So, in the end, you can show that the back reaction of but these... Uh, we also don't have a proof that 
Oh, I mean, those exist, right? No, this I, I, I would disagree with, right? So the solution is Calabria with a conformal factor, and this conformal factor obeys a generalized Laplace equation. And what you do is that you show that this generalized Laplace equation at least doesn't have a global obstruction to be solved. Doesn't mean you solve it. I mean, we have solved it for tori. There are explicit solutions for tori. But I, there, you see that there's no global obstruction. And then you say, a la Joyce, okay, but that means that there must be a solution because I don't see a global obstruction. And I think for DJKT is the same. The only issue, but I leave it to maybe Alessandro to comment on this, is that once you start intersecting these orientifolds, like what is really the picture? And this is why the M theory lift is desired, because then all of that is gone and it should be pure geometry. Yeah. Since you mentioned me, now I have to say something. So the, um, I think the, uh, my feeling is that your plane intersections can be avoided by working on a more complicated, uh, complicated Calabria that is not a toss. Um, and that's my hope. I wouldn't say that we have a proof. Uh, what you said is we have lack of <laughs> uh, argument against which is, I guess, a good beginning. Yeah. Uh, since I have uh, the mic, just <laughs> one more comment. So they, um, I looked it up, so they, what you uh, told me uh, about the supersymmetry of your solutions that you have trouble showing it in the localized. Ah, yes. That, is, that, is that right? Did you understand correctly? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I don't think it ruins your story in any way. Uh, no, but it would be. I think that would be impo important to, yeah. to fill that gap, because uh, then. Yeah. Um, so the, much of the evidence uh, from that paper that you mentioned by Collins, and so, and so Collins is an expert in uh, Cesar Einstein geometry. But I feel that's kind of a bit irrelevant, maybe, because for extended supersymmetry, um, we do expect not to have uh, scale separation. So, you know, you, co you, you know, collect a lot of evidence for a conjecture by looking exactly where you know already that it's going to hold. So if you read the paper, it was also my impression that the intuition comes from extended supersymmetry, but then they also give a lot of examples with minimal supersymmetry, but they're sort of inspired by orbit folding and any of the... Uh, yeah, yeah, so the, uh, to correct myself, there, there is one impressive feat, which is, um, so there's a math paper where they sh show for orbit folds of spheres that there is yeah. um, indeed a bound in there, and, and the diameter, that's a non-trivial, very non-trivial fact. Yeah. Um. Can, can you say a bit more about this um, dual CFD of this uh, putative solution? So, uh, so you showed the, this table of integer dimensions. So yeah. what, what is like the minimal amount of uh, single trace operators that you have? Like so the, the easiest case is in which I don't have uh, any uh, complex structure uh, moduli. Okay, so I have a Calabria with only killer moduli. And then I don't have the relevant uh, deformations here. So then this thing is cut out. And the original paper by Kachru et al, they actually had a single killer, or no, they, had a, but they only had like a three killer Calabia. So there were just a few of them. So they had this one and then that one. So six, five, and 10, 11 are the, the dimensions that appear. Uh, so what about, um, so you said that uh, the KK scale can be arbitrarily large relative. So, so in, this, in this dimension will be parametrically large. Yeah. But then the Planck scale is even larger. Yeah. So is there some fixed relation between how these things go to infinity? Like yeah, there is. Well? Yeah, it's all fixed. You, there's little wiggle room in this. Yeah. So um, one, like uh, the... Maybe it's related to the, to the way the central charge uh, scales with n. So the, the kk scale will go with some, uh, with the central, the square root of the central charge or some power of... So the this, so I can read off from the table. So in this case, if my memory is correct, the central charge scales like n to the 4.5, so 9 over 2, which is a very strange number. And um, here we have like the volume, the way it blows up and the string coupling. Uh, I don't know, does it help? So C goes like N to the 4.5, uh, which is something that we've never observed, of course, but yeah. Thank you.
about these list of dimensions and this integer property. Um, I mean, you could compute the one-loop correction to them. You might naively expect that this integrality would get broken. Is the claim of the shift symmetries that actually that would have to be preserved but to all orders in perturbation theory, and then magically it no, doesn't get? No, this should be a no, no. This is only true at uh, infinite n. Yeah, yeah. So, so then we do expect the integral property to go away at loop order, right? At finite n? Yeah. No, no. Perturbatively in, in one over n. I mean, it seems the only counter argument to that happening would be this emergent symmetry, which then perhaps should be preserved to all orders. But I guess that's my question: Is that the expectation, or is it that the integrality gets broken? So wait, can, can you rephrase it in terms of 1 over n corrections? Because I'm a sure. bit confused with yeah. the way. So, so I mean, if you compute the 1 over n corrections to these dimensions, um, will they be non-zero? I would say they're non-zero, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, then, so then it seems this, this integrality is a property really in the infinite n limit. Yes, yeah. And it's peculiar, but it maybe is not so fundamental if that's, if that's true. Fine, yeah. It was just weird if you look at all the possible numbers for which if you take the square root in the right way, you would have given an integer or only a few options and it exactly selects them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then it has been checked you, you, you for sort of related flux compactifications. They exhaust all of them. So, okay, I haven't talked about it, but there are more flux compactifications of this kind where you go to generalized Calabi-Aus even without scale separation and they literally pick out these weird numbers for reasons that beat me, yeah. yeah. So I have the feeling there is something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no further questions, let's thank Tomas for a very nice talk. Thank you.